that is in the distal end of the cap. Uh, so you can see here the marking clip and then this small nodule just to the left of the marking clip with cautery marks surrounding that. You'll notice we're uh, using a grasping device here. It's very important for safety and prevention of complications uh, how we perform the uh, retraction of the lesion into the scope. We're used to using suction, uh, and I'll go into this more with my uh, later lecture. We generally do not use suction. We only use mechanical traction of this lesion. And you can see we pull the lesion. In fact, in the left upper corner, approximately 10 o'clock, you can see one of the cautery marks. Now watch the white ring uh, move forward as we deploy uh, the the, uh, the over-the-scope clip. It's very important for safety reasons and prevention of complications that we fully deploy the over-the-scope clip before closing the snare. What you don't see is the snare, which is uh, uh, implanted in the distal end of the cap. Uh, so uh, once we deploy the clip, and here's the ring going forward, now we can close the snare. And we actually have a, a timeout-like procedure uh, with the nurses. We all confirm that this, the clip is deployed fully and then close the snare and then apply electrosurgical current, um, which you'll see in just a moment. Now the lesion, we've cut through the lesion, and we'll discuss that in more detail in the subsequent lecture as to why that step is so Im important. So then we withdraw the upper endoscope here. Uh, and, uh, and we can see, uh, you'll see in a moment, we uh, release the lesion uh, onto the bedside table here. We can make some measurements of the lesion uh, and see that it's, uh, in fact, fully resected. And we'll just go to a couple of short videos. So this is, uh, let me advance here. So here's the lesion on the bedside approximately a one and a half to two centimeter lesion. Uh, you might be able to appreciate that all of the electrocautery marks were visible um, uh, on the uh, surrounding uh, the, the visible nodular lesion. So you can see the white electrocautery marks around the small nodule in the center. And then lastly, we re-endoscope the patient uh, now without the cap uh, on the device and notice that there is some hemorrhage and some small mucosal tears, particularly in the upper sphincter. And we'll talk about that. There's some mucosal tears here, relatively superficial, but not completely inconsequential. And also some blood in the esophagus. And again, at the lower esophageal, there's a small hematoma that you can see uh, at the lower esophageal sphincter. So here is the uh, deployment of the device. This is the proper view, you can actually see the uh, extra gastric fat, uh, confirming that this is a full thickness resection. Uh, it is the inverted uh, layers of the gastric wall, uh, and thus confirming that it is a, a proper complete closure or resection, and in this case, a complete closure. So I think the points of discussion here, uh, finally, the pathology was favorable. It was an eight millimeter intramural, primarily in the submucosa. Uh, renal cell carcinoma, and the margins were negative. So overall, a favorable outcome. But I think the issues for discussion, uh, in my view here, related to uh, complications or adverse events. First of all, we should know that this is not the labeled indication for this device. This device is approved for lower gastrointestinal uh, applications, particularly refractory or scarred colonic polyps. So we use this off-label. And so how do we instruct the patient? Uh, we had a discussion with this patient. We actually had him meet with a surgeon uh, to uh, make sure that he was aware of all options. And we informed the patient that this device was only approved, at least in the United States, for lower gastrointestinal application. One of the major technical issues with this device is it's very large, uh, almost two and a half centimeters in diameter. So almost like the achalasia dilation you saw before, we are performing a two and a half centimeter dilation just passing this device, which has sharp edges uh, because of the, um, the over the scope clip. And we have to pass that through both the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. And lastly, how do we avoid uh, major adverse events, such as perforation of the stomach wall and entrapment of adjacent structures? 
Regarding the second point, um, role of predilation. In this case, uh, there was very little experience to go on. This was uh, one of the first cases we had performed in our hospital, and there were very few reported uh, uh, uses of this in the upper gastrointestinal tract. So before I took on this case, I called uh, two colleagues who had used this before. I called Muin Kashab at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and I called uh, Greg Haber uh, in New York, who had had experience with this in the upper gastrointestinal tract. And both of them told me that they predilated the upper esophageal sphincter to 20 millimeters, and also predilated the lower esophageal sphincter to 20 millimeters. And when we passed the device through the esophagus, we, in fact, put a 20 millimeter balloon in front of the cap, and we predilated immediately prior to passing the cap, and then deflated the uh, balloon to 18 millimeters and used the balloon actually as a bougie uh, device so that we could immediately follow the, uh, the balloon uh, with the cap device. Despite that, we still saw minor mucosal tearing of the esophagus, um, and the patient did uh, have some esophageal pain after the procedure uh, which we have monitored them in the hospital overnight with topical uh, analgesic agents. The other major issue that we confronted is how do we avoid the serious adverse events? And this will be discussed in some detail uh, in the afternoon uh, lecture. However, there are a couple of important points. First, we were fortunate that this device had been evaluated extensively here in Europe prior to coming to the United States. So we knew what adverse events could occur, and we also knew how those could likely be prevented. First of all, the perforation, perforations that have been reported largely occurred by incorrect deployment of the over-the-scope clip, where it was not fully deployed before the snare was closed and cut. And so the clip had not, in fact, been deployed. And by cutting through this tissue that was retracted into the cap, uh, those cases described very large perforations. So this white ring was added that I showed you, and that white ring uh, allows the endoscopist to be quite certain that the clip is fully deployed around the lesion before the snare is closed. We also use the timeout-like procedure, so we verbally, uh, all in the room with the nurse and, uh, and the technician, we confirm that the clip is closed. We all say, yes, the clip is closed. We then confirm that the snare is closed, and we all say, yes, the snare is closed before we cut through the lesion. And lastly, the other major adverse events that have been reported with this device are the entrapment of adjacent structures, uh, primarily other lumens of bowel. In the greater curvature, we know from uh, the lumen opposing metal stent literature that we can intentionally create a gastroenteric anastomosis. And in fact, this has been described in the literature particularly when using suction to pull that gastric wall in. If there are any adhesions on the outside of the bowel wall, of the gastric wall, uh, that adjacent lumen can be also suctioned in and entrapped in this very large diameter clip. And it is in those cases where there have been inadvertent or unintentional entrapment of adjacent structures. They could be entrapment of another lumen of bowel. Other cases have been reported of trapping the ureter, uh, in, particularly in sigmoid lesions. So to avoid that, it's now advised uh, uh, by the company to avoid the use of suction and to only use mechanical traction. And to my knowledge, there have not been such complications when only uh, mechanical traction is used. Uh, so I will stop there, and I think that covers uh, all of the, uh, the, 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 the case. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. Which layer this lesion was? So it was actually in the submucosal layer, which is interesting because this is a metastasis. Um, you would think that it would be a peritoneal metastasis um, from the renal cell, but likely it was an intravascular metastasis uh, within the uh, vessels of the submucosa. Um, in reviewing the literature, because this, we had never seen such a case, uh, renal cell carcinoma actually has been reported to behave in this way with very late uh, recurrence of, of isolated metastasis. We sometimes see this in pancreas. Uh, we are called to do an US FNA of a solid pancreas lesion, and it is a late recurrence of a renal cell carcinoma. It's one of the few lesions that does behave this way. <laughs>
Uh, did you tell the patient about the risk of incomplete resection? Because in FTRD in the upper GI, sometimes the problem is that you have no full thickness because of the muscle layer. Yeah, so this is always, uh, this is included, actually, our consent form includes essentially all possible uh, uh, adverse events, including failure of the procedure to achieve its intended goal. Um, the, the most common place where we see incomplete resection is actually in the rectum, uh, probably because of the, the greater fixation of the perirectal wall within the pelvis. Um, but it certainly was a consideration here. One of the main issues is we didn't know for sure which layer this would occur in. We, we had assumed that because it was a, a metastasis from another lesion, it would actually be in the, uh, the fourth layer uh, of the, the stomach wall. So we very much wanted a full thickness resection. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, the, the margins were negative in this case, and it was, in fact, in the submucosal layer. Okay, very successful procedure. I think there are no more questions. So I think we'll proceed to the next lecture. And I think it's also... Um, Michael, you have the next lecture is also yours. <laughs> they changed the program. <laughs> so please come again. We are so sorry. So in, in fact, that's what I had originally thought, although on the program they, they had my, my next lecture in the afternoon. So now I will actually talk about, in some more detail, uh, the, the actual complications of the over the scope. And I'll particularly focus on full thickness resection because uh, this is a relatively new device that we're just beginning to use uh, throughout the world. And I think we should all understand the proper indications and safety measures of this device. Let's see if we can advance the slides, please. Thanks. So I think all of you are familiar with the over-the-scope closure uh, system, uh, so-called OVESCO or OTSC. Uh, it was developed uh, many years ago and has been uh, become a very important part of all of our uh, uh, endoscopy units for management of severe refractory bleeding and closure of perforations. What is relatively new is the modification of this device for the purpose I just showed, a so-called full thickness resection device. The key principal differences between the original OTSC here, and we should mention there are at least two brands. This is the padlock device, this is the Ovesco device, and this is the full thickness resection device. And you can see the major differences. Now it has an over sleeve that allows an external snare catheter, and that snare is pre-looped in the rim of the cap here. It has this white ring, which allows easy visualization that the clip is in fact fully deployed and comes with the grasper device uh, that you saw in the video. There are some special instructions for how to prepare this device, particularly with the uh, the oversleeve and the snare, which are important for prevention of complications and other adverse events. So, uh, in fact, in the United States now, the Food and Drug Administration requires that all endoscopists who use this undergo approximately a three to four hour training course and be certified in its use. It's one of the few devices that actually requires a specific training program uh, in order to use it. Now, this is the overall setup. This is the cap, this is the oversleeve, which is uh, mounted on a, a, a sock-like device for uh, uh, mounting on the endoscope. Several uh, tape, adhesive, um, uh, uh, adhesive tape for uh, uh, mounting that onto the endoscope. Other than that, it's very similar to the over-the-scope uh, clips that we have all used. One of the major differences is, in fact, the large size of the cap. So uh, here, again, you can see this special ring applicator, and when the clip is fully deployed, that ring advances to the end of the visible cap, and it's quite easy to see in here the endoscopic view, the white ring in its undeployed position and its deployed position on the right after the clip application. Uh, there are several steps involved to prevent complication, and I think the main message that I have today is that most of the described adverse events are preventable with these techniques, but they must be followed very precisely to prevent the known complication. First of all, marking the lesion. We, typically, we do this with electrocautery marks, um, typically just the tip of a snare or any other electrocautery system, although there is one that comes with the endoscope uh, device itself. 
Uh, we also use an additional clip because of the limited visualization. And in the lower GI tract, we do leave a guide wire uh, to help us advance through the lumen, especially if there's some sigmoid narrowing. Secondly, the device is mounted on the endoscope using the instructions for use, and then the endoscope is carefully advanced back into the lumen of the gut, and the electrocautery electrosurgical unit is attached. The lesion is uh, positioned over uh, the cap and is grasped and mobilized into the cap, as you can see on the right here, without, importantly, without the use of suction. Um, here, we like to visualize that the marked tissue is completely in the cap. You could see that on the video. You could see the electrocautery marks, at least some of them, although typically not all of them. We can only see them in the video on the 10 o'clock uh, view. Uh, the clip is then deployed. As I said, we all confirm, like a timeout procedure, we all agree that the clip has been deployed. There's a safety lock that uh, uh, we must remove to close the snare. We then close the snare and apply electrosurgical current and cut through the tissue. Here again are some examples. This is a lower GI, and this is from the public. Uh, this is from a publication by Dr. Kaka and Schmidt, uh, who I believe are here today. This is a fixed, uh, previously manipulated polyp in the colon that was not lifting uh, for standard endoscopic mucosal resection because of the prior incomplete resection. You can see the device uh, is mounted over the lesion. It is mechanically pulled into the cap, and here the typical view that you see, notice the white ring is visible here, and then once it's deployed, the white ring is no longer visible. And here the final view, again, with the full thickness of the bowel wall inverted into the cap with the surrounding of fat layers uh, uh, clearly demonstrated. You can see again from this uh, a publication that it is truly a full thickness resection in most cases with the uh, muscularis propria and the surrounding serosa or adventitia. This is the, uh, these are some ex vivo experiments provided to me by Ovesco uh, that show why we avoid the use of suction. So this is a very large 23 diameter, uh, 23 millimeter diameter opening so that if you suction you can invert not only the bowel wall, but if there are adhesions or adjacent structures, those can also be trapped within the clip. So it is advised that we avoid the use of suction and only pull the tissue in with a grasper. Although in theory, if there is a dense adhesion to an adjacent structure that could still be inverted into the cap, uh, we believe, at least theoretically, that using mechanical traction only reduces the risk of entrapment of adjacent structures. In terms of the, uh, the other uh, uh, challenges, one of the main difficulties is actually just inserting the endoscope with this large device uh, attached. The view is extremely limited, which you saw. And this is especially true when there's significant sigmoid narrowing, fixation, or severe diverticulosis. So in our case, we actually use a guide wire uh, uh, a marking of the lesion. I don't typically use uh, fluoroscopy, but some uh, groups have reported that uh, in difficult cases. And most of the failures to reach the lesion were, in due, were due to uh, sigmoid uh, 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 narrowing uh, and diverticular disease. Um, there are a few other important technical parameters when you place this sleeve over the device. You actually want to make sure to place the distal most adhesive tape slightly above the end of the cap. Uh, there are some common problematic issues if you uh, tape it directly to the cap. Actually, air and liquid uh, from the endoscope can actually get inside the oversleeve uh, and cause very difficult time as you uh, get the stool and liquid uh, and air into the uh, sleeve itself. So uh, when you take these courses, they will give you very detailed instructions on taping the sleeve approximately one centimeter above the end of the cap. The electrosurgical currents used are typical uh, cutting currents, not coagulating currents. So depending on which generator you use, for example, if you use the Irby generator, it would be uh, endocut Q, uh, effect one, uh, duration four, interval one, or one for one, or similar uh, highly cutting uh, currents with minimal coagulation with other generators. So what are the known adverse events from full thickness resection? I've listed them here. They include inability to reach the target lesion, usually due to a narrowed or angulated sigmoid, and in the case that I mentioned, the off-label upper GI indication. 
We have technical failure, the inability to remove the intended lesion, as was brought up in the questions. Perforation, uh, this can be either acute, which is usually due to failure to deploy the clip before snare excision, or delayed uh, if the clip does not fully uh, stay attached to the wall. An interesting one has been the application for removal of periappendiceal lesions, and there have been several cases now of appendicitis by closure of the appendiceal orifice at the cecum in an intact, uh, in a patient with an intact appendix. Uh, bleeding has been a minor issue, um, but lumen closure, in fact, closing the sigmoid colon with a bowel obstruction, I'll show you a case in just a moment. And lastly, unintended clip uh, retention um, uh, uh, has now been solved by special removal devices. So here's some of the literature on the adverse events. This is a, a trial published in surgical endoscopy, 60 patients. Most of these were uh, recurrent non-lifting adenomas. Uh, adenomas or uh, partial EMRs that were incomplete or known uh, adenocarcinomas of the colon limited to the, uh, the mucosal uh, layer. So the most, uh, the, the complications or adverse events in this case were failure to reach the lesion, which occurred in approximately 3%, again, all due to fixed or, uh, fixed or diverticular sigmoid. Uh, the success, success rates, 91% on block, 88% full thickness, and 79% R0 or margin negative resections. The adverse events here, overall 7% adverse events. Uh, they had appendicitis in one, although there were only four cases attempted. So uh, this was one out of four, and we'll see this throughout the literature, that the appendicitis rates are relatively high um, if the patient has an intact appendix. Delayed minor bleeding uh, in two patients, and a perforation in one. one of, this was due to a failure to deploy the clip before the snare resection resulting in a very large perforation. Fortunately, it could be closed with a standard over-the-scope uh, over clip device. There were other device malfunctions in approximately 5% of cases, such as failure of the snare to close. Usually this is due to improper alignment of the deployment uh, wire. It's important, as with all of these devices, that you should properly align the deployment wire with the accessory channel. We inspect that carefully to make sure that it, the, the, the uh, string uh, is not trapped within the, uh, trapped within the cap or uh, is misaligned so it's crossing uh, the endoscopic field. And then last, fortunately, uh, these were uh, completed uh, with subsequent removal of the scope and reinsertion and removal with a standard snare device. Uh, again, uh, from the Valley study here, follow-up uh, in about half of the individuals, fortunately none of them had recurrences at a 16-month uh, follow-up. The clip retention rate, interestingly, was only about 12%. We would have thought the clip retention rate uh, would be higher, and all of these were asymptomatic. Um, I want to particularly point out the issue of appendicitis, because this is uh, turning out to be one of the most common uh, complications. It's limited to cases where, as you can see in this case, a typical sessile serrated lesion in the appendiceal orifice. Uh, the lesion is uh, pulled into the cap, deployed. In fact, you can see uh, the muscle layer of the appendiceal, uh, uh, the appendix extending down into the cap, and here's the endoscopic, uh, 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 or the view of the endoscopically resected uh, appendiceal orifice. Um, this is one of the largest series now um, from Dr. Schmidt to Dr. Kaka as well, uh, looking at the uh, uh, FTRD device in colonic uh, applications, a typical uh, uh, types of patients, most of them were non-lifting adenomas and T1 uh, adenocarcinomas. There were actually a fairly large number, 34, that were appendiceal orifice uh, lesions or diverticular uh, lesions. Um, the adverse event rates uh, from this large uh, trial are shown here. Overall, about 5.5% adverse events, four bleeding, two appendicitis, post-polypectomy syndrome, and abdominal pain. The serious adverse events, 4.5% with uh, perforations, most of which were acute. There was one delayed uh, perforation, um, and the acute perforations typically can be managed endoscopically with other clip closure devices. And again, there was a delayed appendicitis that required a laparoscopic appendectomy. And one, and I'll show you, an enterocolonic fistula uh, uh, between the colon and the small bowel, and I'll show you an image of that here on the right. So this is the appendiceal lesion. 
uh, right here. It was uh, completely removed. The patient then developed diarrhea, and at later inspection, you can see a direct fistula between the cecum and the adjacent small bowel. So in this case, the small bowel was pulled into the clip. The clip was closed. Over time, it necrosed and created an enteric colonic anastomosis uh, that um, uh, would likely require surgical revision to close such an anastomosis. Uh, do we need to remove clips? And if so, how can we remove them? Uh, most clips, fortunately, detach spontaneously. Um, there are times where the clips need to be removed, such as misplacement, local complications, such as obstruction or ulceration, or if you're unsure if you have a complete removal. Um, most of these uh, are at the follow-up inspection. There is now a dedicated device. Uh, uh, prior to the availability of this device, people used off-label uh, methods of removal of these, such as very high-powered APC, essentially to melt the metal. Uh, this is now a, 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 a bipolar device that allows you to grasp the hinge here and melt the metal very rapidly, very safely. Uh, because it's bipolar, it does not transmit the energy uh, significantly through the patient's uh, body. Importantly, you must grasp the hinge here, which is sometimes difficult to visualize. Uh, you cannot grasp it at this location. You must grasp it on the lateral location. And you can see in such an example, that would be at this location here, which is somewhat buried, or in these cases on the right upper image at the approximate 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock so it is sometimes difficult to uh, localize that and requires some time to identify that hinge for proper clip removal. Here's a case where that would uh, potentially be necessary. This was another um, uh, fairly large series, 111 cases with 11% adverse events. And I want to focus in this case on this sigmoid closure. So in this case, the clip was deployed. Uh, I believe it was actually used in a diverticular polyp. Uh, that was removed, and in this case, the clip actually caused luminal obstruction. You can see the uh, proximal bowel uh, dilated, air-filled above the clip, and in this case, required surgical removal of the sigmoid, including the clip. Overall, there's a large registry that's sponsored by Ovesco, and they kindly provided me with these uh, slides here. Uh, you can see from this very large registry, 83 hospitals, 120 uh, different users, uh, over 500 uh, procedures, Overall, quite high technical success, 92%, about 86% full thickness, and about 80% R0 resections. But in terms of adverse events, we're consistently seeing this number in the 13, 14, other cases, 11% uh, range. So overall, quite consistent throughout the literature of around between 10 and 15% adverse events. Most of these are minor adverse events with about 2% major adverse events such as those that require surgery to fix. So to summarize, I think the over-the-scope clips and the full thickness resection device are safe and effective when used properly. Most of the adverse events are predictable and potentially preventable. For perforation, we must ensure that the, complete, uh, the clip is completely deployed before snare resection. To avoid entrapment of adjacent structures, we should use mechanical traction only without suction or only minimal suction. To avoid incomplete resection, we really need to limit it to the diameter of the cap. About two to two and a half centimeters is the upper limit of what we can fully resect with this device. Uh, we also need to be cautious about uh, off-label use such as up upper GI. I only have anecdotal experience to share with you, which is the case that I presented earlier. And lastly, for stenotic locations in the tight sigmoid, this is often a contraindication. I think if you have a very difficult time passing a normal scope, um, this is twice the diameter of a normal adult scope, and so would likely be a contraindication for its use. Thank you very much. So, thank you for your excellent talk. Are there any questions to Mike Walls? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Just to rephrase that, the, 
The main point is if you're just treating adenomas, the risk of complications is likely higher than the risk that that patient will suffer some consequence of the adenoma. Most of the literature we're seeing are recurrences of these large polyps. So when we do an EMR or an ESD and that lesion recurs, which is now a very scarred bed, these are usually the most advanced adenomas, so they're typically larger than two centimeters. Some of them have high-grade dysplasia. But I would certainly agree with you that we should limit the use to the very high-risk lesions uh, that really need to be removed by some method. And if this is the only alternative to surgery, I think it's a reasonable alternative to surgery. But low-risk lesions, even a fixed lesion, uh, you know, you could arguably leave that alone. Yes. Next question. Yeah. Would you remove it or would you just uh, take biopsy every two years? Uh, that is more often than the situation that we know it is a T1 cancer. Yeah. So the question was what about large lesions? For example, a three centimeter uh, lesion that's not high grade dysplasia. Um, I think in most fit patients, now we would exclude the 80 or 90 year old unfit patient, but for most fit patients, the likelihood that a three centimeter lesion will progress to cancer in their lifetime is quite high. So most of us would recommend removal by some method of an advanced three centimeter or larger lesion. Yeah, so after first removal, we do know that most of those recurrences can be removed. In fact, the very large trial from the Australian consortium led by Michael Bork, a thousand patients, they had about a six to 10% residual rate at follow-up, but almost all of those are cleared with standard methods. So I think it's important to remember that we can actually clear those recurrences with standard uh, EMR and polypectomy methods. It's not necessary to use the full thickness resection device. And in fact, that is our first choice, is to try to remove it with simple snare techniques. Um, and we really have utilized this only for the most difficult refractory lesions. Michael, some technical question. If you have a large flat lesion, maybe of a diameter of three and a half centimeters, you know the cap will not be large enough to get all the uh, things out. And in the center of this lesion, there is uh, a fixed area. Do your peripheral mucosal resection and then in the same session FDRD of the center or what's your approach to that? Yeah, so I must say I only have uh, experience with a small number of these cases, um, but uh, what's uh, my own limited experience and what I've read in the literature uh, is, as you've said, uh, if you, you need to reduce the size of the lesion down below two to two and a half centimeters. That's really the maximum that we can remove. So I think it's reasonable to, to snare the perimeter of the lesion, what you can easily remove by snare. And if there's a remnant central lesion that is highly fixed that you cannot remove, then to apply this device to the center of that lesion. Mm -hmm. The other methods uh, have been described are the avulsion methods, so both hot avulsion and cold avulsion. Um, so those are also other effective options in that setting. Okay. 